Welcome everyone to the weekly Chabura. Uh, this week's Chabura is on Parshas Emor. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, thank Chazak, to thank Torah Anytime for all that they do, and of course to thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu for giving me the opportunity um, to delve into his Torah a little bit, to give over some of what I've learned, and it's a big schos for me to be able to, uh, to do this. I will say to you that says mitamida yoisimikulam that we know that a uh, a rebbe benefits the most from his students mitamida yoisimikulam. So what does that mean? The Gemara says that a, a rebbe gains the most from his talmidim. So I want to explain that when a rebbe knows that he has to give something over and he's not just learning for himself, what ends up happening is that he takes it more seriously. Um, it shouldn't be that way, but he does. He takes it more seriously. He prepares himself in case someone asks questions. And he wants to make sure that he's clear, clear in everything he says. So there is that benefit of mitamida yoisa mikulam for that reason alone. For that reason alone. Now, Parshas Emar has 63 mitzvahs. If I'm not mistaken, that is the most uh, mitzvahs uh, mentioned in a single parsha. So it's chus also to have so many mitzvahs. But we're going to focus only on one or two, or maybe even three mitzvahs. From, uh, from the parsha, um, I do want to mention something very fascinating. Now, every word of Torah is fascinating, and every word of Torah is is nitzchias, is diamonds. Um, but I saw something a few years ago that was brought to my attention. Sadly, I didn't see it before, but it was brought to my attention. I want to start off the year with this burst of I want to say inspiration of greatness of how the Torah thinks and how we're supposed to think like the, like the Torah teaches us to. We know, again, I'm going to skip a little bit before we get into the Indian of Tumah of Kohanim, I want, to, I want to mention this vart. We know that a Koyen Gadol is not allowed to marry certain women. And we do know that a Koyen Hedjit is allowed to marry, um, actually is also not allowed to marry certain women. But the Koyen Gadol has one specific woman that he cannot marry over the Koyen Hedjit. What does that mean? Koyen Hedjit is not allowed to marry a Grusha, he's not allowed to marry a Chalutza, He's not allowed to marry a Cholol. He's not allowed to marry a Gioris. But a Kohen Gadol has one added woman that he has not allowed to, to marry. And that is an Almana, a widow. And the obvious question is not why a Kohen can't marry those, but why a Kohen Gadol, Dafka a Kohen Gadol, is not allowed to marry um, um, an Almana, a widow. And if I didn't see this myself in the Das Kane and Bali Taisvis, I, I wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. But what the Das Kane and Bali Taisvis says, the reason actually, now we don't need to know reasons, but he actually gives a reason. The Bali Taisvis, he gives a reason why a Kayin Gadol is not allowed to marry an Almana. And it's something, it's earth shattering, it is inspirational, it, is, it, is, it, it guards us in, in a, a very almost, I wouldn't say scary, but uh, the word Pachat in Hebrew is a very good word to understand this, this uh, Memra that the Bali Taisvah says. The Bali Taisvah says that the reason why a Koyen Gadol is not allowed to marry a widow is because the Torah is worried that on the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, Shabbos Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, the holiest day for the Koyen Gadol is Avodah for the year, Yom Kippur, at the holiest time in the afternoon, when he's about to enter the holiest place in the world, the Kodesh Hakdashim, and the Koyen Gadol is at the peak of his Ruchnius, he's at the peak of his Kedusha, he's at the peak of him being able to do for Klai Yisrael, which no other time of the year this Koyen Gadol can do. We're worried, the Baal HaTaisra says, that the Koyen Gadol might have seen a woman in the past and that when he knows he has the power of Kedusha and the power of his words, he's like a Malach on that, at that moment. We're worried that he might actually daven that the husband of this woman that he saw should die so that he could maybe, maybe have a chance of marrying her one day. Now I, got, I need you to understand the depth of what I just said from the Bali Taishas. Again, if I didn't see it inside, which I did, it would be shocking. We're worried that the holiest person of the world, in the world, the Kayin Gadol, at the holiest 
day of the year, Yom Kippur, at the holiest time, right before he walks in a Kedush HaKadosh, where he's about to daven for all of Kla Yisrael. He's about to be, uh, bring a carbon to go into the Kedush HaKadosh for all of Kla Yisrael. We're worried that in his mind, he might have seen a woman, and because he knows he has the power of Dibur, the power to daven for Kla Yisrael, he will actually have in mind at that moment to daven that another husband should, be, should die so that he, because he can't marry Grusha anyway, that he should die and therefore what would happen? He would think about maybe having a chance of marrying this man, this woman, sorry. This is the koach, this is the koach of, of what it means a person has to be careful when it comes to certain inyanim of Arias, of Ishos that we're worried that Kohen Gadol might have that machshava, and he might be able to accomplish it through his tefillah, which also shows the greatness of tefillah from the Kohen Gadol. And that's why, you know, we explain why, we, why do we learn, why do we lane on, um, in Yom, on Yom Kippur, we learn, we lane the inyanim of Arias by Mincha time. Why would we even think that we should, we should lane about Arias by Mincha time? We already went through a Kol Nidre, we went through days of Elul. We went through days of our Seri Simei Tshuva. We went through days where at the, we're at the peak, right before Ne'ilah, of the greatest moment of each person's ye- year, greatest moment of Tshuva, Mamish, right before Ne'ilah, that we're worried that what? That we should discuss Arias, because that's the, the, the Kaya Hatuma that Arias can cause. Therefore, we have to be very, very on guard. We have to be very vigilant. We have to be very careful when it comes to certain inyanim that never, never trust in yourself. And never, ever, like we say, the Chazal tells us, a person should never, ever say that I'm okay and I'm safe and I don't have to worry. But from this week's parasha, we see an incredible thing from the Kohen Gadol. So I needed to throw that out at you right away because I think even if you don't listen to the rest of the shir, this particular... Um, das Kain of Bali Taisvis is so powerful that it is um, that it is worth it just to listen to that just for those few moments of what I told you. Now we're going to get into the parsha. The parsha begins. That a kohen should not become tame to people of his own nation, obviously. Ba'amav, we learn from that. The Ba'amav refers to what? Kla Yisrael and not to non-Jews. Because to non-Jews, he could technically, he can become Tomei too. But to his own people, he cannot become Tomei because they have a nefesh. And when the nefesh leaves a guf, he becomes Tomei. The body becomes Tomei. So there's a few things that need to be discussed there. Let's go to Rashi. First of all, before we go to Rashi, what is the Lashon Vayoyim Hashem? Usually it says Vayidabra Hashem. Here it is the Lashon Vayoyim speak. Not only that, it says Vayidabra Hashem Amosha. Instead of saying Daber Elo Kohanim, it says again the Lashon Emar. Ben Aaron Amarta Leyem. Again the Lashon Amarta, Lashon of Amira. What is the difference between the Lashon of Amira and the Lashon of Dibor, of, of to be Medaber? So we do know from, um, uh, by Har Sinai, that Kai Sagid Libanay Yisrael was the Lushan of Sagid to the women and the men for the men they use the Lushan of Dibur, Daber. Daber is a much string, a more stringent Lushan. It's a stricter Lushan. It's almost demanding. When it says in the Torah the Lushan of Yadabr, it's almost a command. When it says the Lushan of Ayoimir or Emar, it's a soft Lushan to almost like coax them. Into, into understanding it, even though they have to keep it, but say it in a nicer Lushan. And the question is why, specifically over here, does it use a nicer Lushan when it comes to something like, t- like Tumuf to a coin, which what I, I would think is very, very stringent. I would think, which it is, I would think it's very, very uh, important, like all the other mitzvot. Why is there a softer Lushan? And then there's another question. An obvious question, what is the double Lashon of Emer al kahanim speak to the Kahanim, but Aaron Vermar to and say to them. All the Pasuk should have said is, I'm sorry, Vermar to kahanim and, and tell them, doesn't have to say the double Lashon of Emer, and it doesn't have to say the, the Lashon of Amarta. So Rashi, Rashi right away um, says, what's the double Lashon? To warn the older ones on the younger ones, which means that the, the elder Kohanim that are mechoyev to be careful from the inyani of Tumah, they should be careful to already warn the younger Kohanim 
and the ones that are not mechuyev, they're, they're under bar mitzvah, they're under the age of being careful that they should already be aware of this Indian of Tumah and they should stay away. They should stay away even when they're not mechuyev in certain mitzvahs. That is the power of the Indian of Tumah that a person should not become tume to a, um, to a uh, human being, to a yid. Now the question is, what is it about Tumah that's, that, that when a neshama leaves a body, becomes tume? What is it? We know everything's the Abish is Cheshbainus, and we know the Abish has a reason, obviously, for everything, and we don't have to know every reason, and even the reasons we think we know, we could be not even the reason why Hashem gave it, but He lets us at least understand the reason that we can understand through our Chazal to tell us what something is the reason for. But what is it about a guf, a body, that when the nefesh leaves the body, it becomes tame? So I saw something really magnificent. I saw something beautiful. The human being is created for a purpose. The human being is created to do something. The human being is created to accomplish, to grow, to build. Once a human being is lacking that potential, is lacking the capability of growth, automatically he becomes Tomei. The void of, of, of doing something for the world, from being something important, doing something accomplishing, automatically makes him Tomei. That means that a human being, when he's born, becomes, is a Kaddish, a child, a person is born, he's born holy. Leif Tahar, Broly Kim. I'm born with a certain Leif, with a certain holiness. But we contaminate ourselves through our actions. But at the same time, we have the potential to move, to grow, to build. Therefore, we are considered alive. Once the nefesh of a person leaves him, then he becomes I won't say in, in, insignificant, but in the big picture of the world, he's insignificant. He, there's nothing that he can do for the world. And therefore, and therefore, it becomes tame. It becomes impure. The lack of growth, the lack of potential makes it impure. So what about a Kayan? Why should a Kayan be told to keep away? In reality, most of the time a person deals with, with someone that's, a person that's a mess, someone that dies, it's obviously a, a re, it's usually a situation where you're doing something positive. You're burying somebody, you're visiting a caver, you're, you're involved with a mace, you're causing comfort to people, you're saying goodbye to the, to the nifter. These are all positive things. So why is a coin not allowed to become tummy to a mace? So I also saw something really I thought was really telling. That the coin, his job as a, as a coin is to constantly be available to do for Klai Yisrael. He needs to be constantly on guard, constantly available, that his mission in life is that he was put aside by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to help Klai Yisrael, to do for Klai Yisrael. Once this Kayan understands this concept, he needs to be able to stay away from a dead person because what did we just say? That the dead person is lack of growth, lack of doing, lack of movement. He needs to stay so far away that he can't even become Tame because he needs to understand the concept of staying away from lack of growth, lack of potential, and lack of doing because he can't slack off even a moment. So this, what defines the dead person that he is not moving, not growing, not building, the Kayin has to stay far away from him. Yet Chazal tells us, Chazal, the Torah tells us that for seven relatives, a Kayin can become Tame too. To the wife, to the mother and father, to the brother and sister, the sister that's not married yet, to a son and a daughter, for those he's allowed. The question is, if he can't become Tameh, why should he be allowed to become Tameh to these? Because the Torah understands human nature, obviously. The Torah, like Dibra Torah, El Keneged Yetzeshaladam. The human being, the Kayan knows, the Kayan knows that, the Chazal know, the Torah knows, that a Kayan Lamaisa is going to be affected terribly. When these seven people pass away, that the Torah said, no, to these people, not only do you become defiled to them, but there's a chiv, there's a chiv, believe it or not, there's a chiv on the Kayan to actually become tame. Which means if a Kayan says, I don't want to become tame to these people, we, we force him, we force him. Because the Torah knows that the human emotion and the human understanding of the Kayan needs to mourn and be there for, for those seven relatives. Yet the Kayan Gadol, this is fascinating, the Kayan Gadol is not allowed to become tummy to these people. But what about his emotions? What about his feelings? What? He's also a human being. So we learn from this, all the Rishonim tell us, that a Kayan Gadol is on a higher darga. He's already put automatically 
by our Kaddosh Baruch Hu on this high darga, on this high um, pedestal, that he cannot become um, close or tame to his krovim because he almost in a way can handle it. He almost in a way has reached such a darga of, of holiness that he can overcome the lack of emo- the, the, he can overcome the emotion that would go into that he would need to mourn, he can overcome that. Yet that same Kayan Gadol were worried that he should not marry an Almana because he might actually think on the holiest time of year um, uh, to a, uh, um, of a woman that her husband should pass away. So that is the Koach of A, the Kayan Gadol, but I, I love the Diyak, I loved it so much of what the Indian of Tame is and what, how a person is supposed to stay away from that. Um, that's one of the things I wanted to mention. Also, I want to mention something where Moshe Feinstein brings down on the Lushan of Emmer and Vera Marta. He says that really if you look at the Lushan on Vera Marta Alehem, it seems to go back to who? To the elders, to the Kohanim. Emmer Elo Kohanim, right? B'nai Vera Marta Alehem and tell them Alehem is going back on the Kohanim. It should have said if it meant to Emmer should mean like Rashi said, Lahazi Gedolim Alaktanim. The Lashon should have been to warn the young one, the older ones on the young ones. It should have been Emmer to speak Elokanim Ramarta and say the so double Lashon would tell us that what that refers to a different group of people, which would be the Katanim, would be the younger ones. Yet it says Alehem. So from the words Alehem, Ramosha says that's all that what that it seems to be going back on the original Kohanim. So how does he learn Rashi? He says. He says that really the Emmer is going on the Kohanim themselves. Vermarta is also going on to those Kohanim. That through your actions, he says, you will be speaking louder than words. In other words, when you show through your actions a certain understanding how careful you are, then the young children in the future will see this and they will actually be careful themselves. Therefore, it's really going on the same people, the same Kohanim. But, Lahazik Dolim Alaktanim. Through the Amarita, through your actions of simcha and joy, that you fulfill the mitzvot, he actually says, he refers to simcha and joy, which means a softer lashon. That how are you masbered to these children? Through, the, through positivity, through a good influence. And Rabbi Moshe goes on to say in this Indian, he says that a Rebbe, this is what he says, a Rebbe that knows the day that he's going to go into class, that he's not on top of his game, besimcha, he's not joyful. And B, he cannot show the love that he's supposed to show to his Talmidim. There is a chiv on him to not go into teach that day. Which means it's not just, you know, 90% of the time I'm in a good mood. Today I'm in a bad mood for a reason. I'll try not to let it out on my students. I'll try to be joyful. I'm having a bad day. Something happened to me. No, you, you have a chiv not to go in. You cannot go in to teach Torah to children if you're not going in with the love that you need to have and the simcha you need to have. So it's, it's a very important lesson because children are very influenced by what's going on. You could think that you have an excuse why you're not feeling well. You can feel that, listen, nine out of ten days I am feeling great. Today I'm under the weather emotionally. It's a big deal. So one day my kids won't see me in the most joyful way. No, you must teach your children to always be joyful and a Rebbe should not go in, he said, to teach if he feels he can't be, A, on top of his game emotionally, spiritually, and besimcha rabba. So those are a few things I wanted to mention. Um, we're going to end in two, three minutes. I just want to mention something very powerful about Rabbi Akiva and his and Sfir Saimer. It always bothered me. You know, I tried to do a little research on what happened during Sfir Saimer. I tried to do a little research, and there's not much written. There's not much written regarding the Tamidim of Rabbi Akiva. It's mentioned why they were nifter, because they didn't show cover to each other. But the whole story of what happened with Rabbi Akiva and his Tamidim, I didn't see anywhere. Now, I'm sure it is mentioned somewhere. I'm not the biggest Talmud Chacham. I don't know where it is. I asked certain people. I haven't seen much. But we do know that they were nifted because they didn't show proper kavod one to another. So the obvious question that should be asked is, number one, the first day, 24,000 people were nifted. The Avis Tamid were nifted from the time of what? Of sec- pretty much after Pesach till, till, um, till Lagba Omer, which is why we, we stopped the mourning process by Lagba Omer. Sphira continues, but the mourning because they stopped. So by Daniel Gladstein Schlitter, who I love his stuff, I really want to tell you, if you really want to learn unbelievable Torah on anything, 
Go lear, learn Rabbi Daniel Gladstein's stuff, whether it's on, on Purim, Hanukkah, Sukkot, Parshas HaShavur. I love his stuff. I go to sleep and I'll be honest, I, I play it. I play it a lot of times in my, in my room. My wife goes to sleep, but we both, we go to sleep to Rabbi Daniel Gladstein's tire. For the, not because it puts you to sleep, but, it, but you go to sleep feeling good about, about what you're learning. So really tremendous stuff. So he asked an obvious question that, why do we celebrate? I'm not going to go into that answer, but he asked, I didn't get to the answer, I, I fell asleep. Um, he asked, I'm going to have to go look at it again. He says, why is it that we celebrate Lag Ba'omer because the Tamidim of Rabbi Akiva stopped dying? There actually there was no one left. You don't celebrate when there's no one left. You stop mourning when no one's left, but you don't celebrate the fact that his Tamidim stopped dying when actually there was no one left. So I actually thought that the kasha wasn't such a big kasha in the middle of the night. It was around 2 in the morning. I remember listening to it, and my wife, yeah, 2 in the morning. And I do remember asking myself, what about the five Talmidim, Reb Shem Bayochai, Reb Meir, Reb Khalid, Reb Yehuda Bar Eloi, and the, uh, Reb, Reb, what was the other one I forgot? Um, Reb Khalif, uh, I forgot, Reb Yoyne Khalifta, I forgot, I forgot the Lashem, the name of the person. But, the, but those five still remain. Those five actually were only made after his Talmidim passed away. So really, in reality, the 24,000 passed away. Then Rabbi Akiva, instead of being depressed to the point where he felt, I'm done, there's no point of building more Tamidim, he went then and he built these five. And look what we got because of those five. Rashim Bayechai, Rabbi Dubai Loi, Rabbi Meir, all these Tanoim, these five that we actually got because of, of, because of, of Rabbi Akiva alone. You see where you can build from the ashes. But the question that I had was, why didn't Rabbi Akiva Call his Tamidim together. You don't see this. And say, listen, we lost 750 for the first day, let's say. 750, 760 Tamidim on the first day. What about the, why didn't he make a meeting saying, we have to do tshuva? Doesn't see anywhere where he, where he stopped it from happening. B, how did it happen? How did it happen? How did he allow it to happen? What he didn't see, his Tamidim were not doing what they should be doing covered wise that's n And also, why don't we see anywhere Rebbe Kiva tried to stem the tide and cause cause a, uh, call a, a getting together of, of his Tamidim to say, we need to stop this, we need to stop this. So, I didn't see the answer, but I came up with my own idea, something to think about, but the question is a tremendous question. Why didn't Rebbe Kiva stop it? Why well, don't see anywhere Rebbe Kiva called a, 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 a Surah that everyone should come together to stop this plague? And, and how did Rebbe Akiva not notice that this was taking place? These are questions. So the answer we're going to end with this is that I, what I wanted to say, I'm going to end in a minute, is when it comes to Torah Messira, when it comes to tran transmitting Torah to the next generation, and you were the vehicles of tra that transmission, it has to be so perfect that even if they would have done tshuva to a certain degree, even if, if Rebbe Akiva would have stopped, would have stemmed the tide, they were not able to give because of that lack, a little bit of kavod, they were not able to be the transmitters of Torah to the next generation. To the point, to the point that they had to die. Because for them living and not being able to transmit the Torah would have been too painful for them. For them to be able, told that they can't be the transmitters of the Torah because of the way they treated each other would have been too great for them to handle. And therefore they had to be, had to be, you know, to die. They went straight to Olam Haba, they went to Olam Haba, I don't know, but they went to Olam Haba. I don't know if they went straight, but they, they were big Tamid Acham, big Tzadikim. But they weren't able to be around to be the transmitters and Rebbe Kiva had to start fresh with his five other Talmidim. So therefore, we understand, you see the power of, of Messiah, the power of Messiah when it comes to Torah. Anyway, we'll end with this. Everyone have a wonderful week. Have a wonderful Shabbos. And Amir Hashem will have something special for Lagba Oymer next week. Cult of. <laughs>